For those of you who don't know me, my name is Caitlin Pena. I am the Director of Operations and Programs for the Center for Election Science. We are a nonpartisan nonprofit that um, is working to strengthen democracy and empower voters with better voting methods. So the main voting method that we advocate for is called approval voting, and it allows you to vote for all the candidates you like and the candidate with the most votes wins. We're currently supporting a campaign in St. Louis, Missouri that would implement approval voting for um, open nonpartisan primaries there. There's a lot of work to be done still. So um, if that sounds like something you're interested in, uh, there are volunteer opportunities. And of course, um, money is always needed. So we would certainly be open to donations. I'll stick some um, links in the chat once, once I uh, stop talking here. Um, but I'm so excited to have everybody here. Um, this is a really, interesting and unique and particularly anxiety inducing election year, I think for many of us. And part of that is because we're concerned about uh, election security, right? So that's part of, that's, that's why we wanted to host this particular event tonight. Um, so with us today, we have Chris Landa. Um, she is the co interim co-director uh, for Verified Voting. Verified Voting is an organization whose mission is to strengthen democracy for all voters by promoting the responsible use of technology in elections. And, you know, election integrity is something that they particularly focus on, which is what we're going to be talking about today. Um, Chris has worked in nearly all aspects of nonprofit management, including fun fundraising, operations, partnerships, and programming. And she became passionate about Verified Voting's mission when she worked as a poll worker in Detroit in 2016 and gained insight into the complex systems behind our democratic process. Chris managed Lieutenant Governor um, Garland Gilchrist's 2017 campaign for Detroit City Clerk, and she also served on Gilchrist's transition team upon his election as Michigan's Lieutenant Governor in 2018. And most recently, Chris transformed and led Venture for America's largest national program serving hundreds of young aspiring entrepreneurs. So welcome, Chris. Um, and interviewing Chris today, we have Aaron Hamlin. He is the executive director and co-founder for the Center for Election Science, the organization who is hosting this, um, this call. So with that, um, I'll leave it to you, Aaron. Um, I will be moderating the chat um, just really quickly. If folks have questions, any Q&A that they um, want to ask of Chris about election security, feel free to drop your questions in the chat. Probably in about the last 15 minutes or so, um, we'll, we'll do a Q&A and I'll read out some questions from the chat box. So uh, with that, I will hand it over to you, Aaron. Awesome. Thanks so much, Caitlin. Uh, so Chris, uh, really want to hear more about verified voting. So maybe you can tell us a bit more about uh, what it's all about, uh, its history, some of the programs that it's doing. Uh, I'll let you take it away. Yeah, absolutely. So we got started in 2004 by computer scientists. Um, they were concerned about how technology was being introduced in elections um, and the vulnerabilities that it was presenting to our democracy. So um, as Caitlin said, you know, our mission is to promote the responsible use of technology in elections in order to strengthen our democracy for all voters. Um, so I think, you know, one of the things that makes us unique is that we're really focused on that election technology piece um, and on ensuring the security aspects. Um, so we oppose internet voting, we um, encourage uh, and advocate for rigorous post-election audits um, to ensure that the winner won and the loser lost, that we can have confidence in that. Um, and um, we also have an incredible database of voting equipment in use in the United States by jurisdiction starting in 2006. So if you go to verifiedvoting.org slash verifier, you can learn a lot more about different technologies and how they're used in different polling locations. Um, so definitely worth taking a look at that as well. Um, so, you know, in terms of election security, there's a lot of different components to it. Um, so, you know, we support an evidence-based election where paper ballots marked by hand or with an assisted device for those who need it. 
strong chain of custody, um, robust post uh, robust post-election risk limiting audits and strong cyber hygiene throughout. And you, you mentioned your your database uh, as well, looking at the different types of of uh, uh, voting machines used in different um, uh, jurisdictions. So I would also encourage uh, all the listeners to check that out at the Verified Voting uh, website. I've used that personally. It's a really well done, really nice uh, resource there. Uh, Thanks. Yeah, we just added um, or recently added the electronic poll books that are in use as well. And you can also see where people rely on paper poll books versus electronic poll books. Um, so we're always trying to add more features into it, but it's a really good way to learn more about voting equipment used in the United States. And so election integrity is kind of a, a complicated uh, topic. It has a lot of uh, facets. You, you mentioned a number of them. Do you have any, like when you're thinking about this personally, I know like with, with us thinking about voting methods, like uh, it can, there are like all these components that can be difficult to really conceptualize everything. Do you have any kind of personal um, strategies that you use or ways that you try to conceptualize, uh, conceptualize, conceptualize uh, election integrity components uh, yourself? Like do you, so how, how do you think about election integrity uh, as a whole? Like how, how do you think about that generally? Um, yeah, I mean, it, it is a really broad concept, right? I mean, I think um, one analogy we use is that it's like a three-legged stool. You have to make sure that voters um, have access to voting, right? Like that they can register to vote. Then you have to make sure that people actually participate and that they vote. And then the last piece is that you have to make sure that their votes are counted as cast. And that to me, it's sort of like the last step in voter enfranchisement, right? Like making sure that people trust that their vote was counted as they wanted it to be counted. Um, and so every like the, everything that leads up to that count and then afterwards, like it, it's all part of election integrity. You need all those different steps in place. Um, I don't know if that answers your question, but I'm hoping it does. Uh, um, one of the areas that your organization talks a lot about is uh, hand -mark, uh, handmarked ballots. And you mentioned before the database uh, that talks about different types of, of voting machines. Uh, and you also have them laid out in kind of different uh, tiers. So how do you see um, handmark ballots uh, fitting into that compared to these other types of, of voting machine uh, setups? Yeah, so we support handmarked paper ballots as the primary method for voters to mark their ballots. Um, there's a number of reasons for this. But handmarked paper ballots don't work for every single voter. There are some voters that have visual impairments or disabilities that need an assisted device. Um, and so we support handmarked paper ballots with assisted device for those who need them. Um, and so in terms of uh, you know, ranking them, I mean, our, our website, The Verifier, you can kind of see what different technologies are in use. Um, I think one thing that's important to keep in mind is that um, you need to have fail safes in place for when technology fails. So this isn't just for the marking method for a ballot, but also for checking in, right? So electronic poll books have some benefits, but we've also seen them um, really cause a lot of long lines in a lot of locations when there's problems with connectivity or loading issues or just like failures. And so any technology needs to have a plan B and a plan C in place, especially when you're thinking about people's voting access, right? Um, and so I think for polling locations that are reliant on technology in so many different places, that's where it can be a problem. So if every single voter has to mark their ballot with a machine um, and the machines aren't working or there's not enough machines, that can create long lines. Um, if you have ballots that are marked by hand and the scanner is down for some reason, you can at least store those ballots um, while you fix the scanner. And then you can, so you can like keep voters going through it. But, um, you know, I, I have to admit, like, it's not like, it's not always the like it's it's complicated right like I was a poll worker in Detroit in Detroit in 2016 there they have handmarked paper ballots but I did see a voter with disabilities wait for two hours because their assisted device was not set up and that's not right right and so you have to make sure that all voters are able to vote so in addition to like having it as a fail safe should uh machines kind of uh 
walk out like uh, like I think we're all used to technology uh, doing sometimes, uh, as well as uh, like uh, addressing the long line component, which we're seeing a lot uh, when uh, some machines are breaking down. Are there any other reasons why hand marked ballots may make sense, um, uh, such as related to security issues or other or other factors? Yeah, I mean, it creates a like the voter is verifying their ballot in a very clear way. Um, you don't have to rely on printouts that might have like text that's too small. Like I know some ballot marking devices, the printout is in size six font, right? And so um, there's like a whole host of reasons why security experts um, on our board, on our board of advisors, all advocate for handmarked paper ballots. Um, there's just, you know, there's just this kind of clarity of intention there um, where you don't have the, the software involved in the marking. One of the uh, rationales I saw in your site for um, utilizing handmarked ballots was uh, being able to uh, conduct audits uh, properly. Uh, so maybe you can share a little bit more about um, what risk limiting audits are uh, in relation to uh, elections and maybe why we should think more about them being utilized more. Yeah, so 99% of ballots are still counted by computers, right? So even those ballots that are marked by hand are ultimately counted by scanners most of the time. And those computers are susceptible to vulnerabilities. They could, they could be susceptible to some sort of like accidental programming error or an intentional one. Um, so we want to make sure there's a check on that computer and making sure that the but we can have confidence that the winner won and the loser lost. Um, so post-election risk limiting audits um, are a way to kind of check that computer count of the ballots. Um, and so um, it's what statisticians um, recommend. There's a number of organizations that promote RLAs as kind of the gold standard of election security of, the, of that post-election audit process. But in order to have an RLA, you have to have voter verified paper ballots um, because you're looking at those by hand and verifying the the count right and that that the the computers counted it correctly would, would you be able to uh, so we have some a lot of technical folks uh that tend to uh, join these calls would you be able to share a little bit about what a risk limiting a risk limited audit uh, looks like in practice I'm not the audit expert on the team. So it's really hard for me to kind of go into the nuts and bolts of it. We do have a lot of audit experts on our team. I encourage people to go to our website to check out our audit page. Um, so um, yeah, I, you know, we can probably share in the chat some more information about how audits work. Um, I think, you know, like the idea is simple that RLAs provide evidence that the computers counted the ballots accurately. We've been advocating them for them for a long time. Um, and so, and have a lot of experience in different types of post-election audits as well. Um, but I will admit that like, I was a comparative literature major. I am not, I am not the statistician on the team. We do have those folks on the team who, who are, who are those um, technical experts. And I think that that's something unique to verified voting is that we provide that sort of technical expertise. Um, and there's just not a lot of organizations and people that know how to do that and know how to support election officials with, with undertaking something that can feel a little bit scary to them initially, um, but really can be implemented and it really does provide assurance. So what we're able to do is partner with election officials to provide that sort of technical expertise so that they can implement the risk limiting audit of, of the election of, um, that they choose or that's um, required by a state statute. But it's another excuse to go to your site because you've got all kinds of great resources there. So uh, everyone should be happy to, uh, to go over there. And uh, also having looked at um, some of the folks on your advisory board, you've got some real heavy hitters there, I think. Um, uh, like Matt Blaze is on there. You've got just like a, a bunch of really uh, 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 Ronald Rivest, I believe, is an, another person that's on there. Um, so, Beth, yeah, he's yeah. a cryptography expert and he's on our board of directors. Um, so yes, lots of tech geeks on our board of advisors and our board of um, directors. And I think it really speaks to how verified voting got started, right? These were computer scientists, technology experts 
who saw how technology was being introduced in elections and were really worried about the implications for our democracy. And we're trying to figure out ways to advocate for more security. And it's sort of counterintuitive to think that a bunch of computer scientists would be advocating for paper, but they were, and they are, and they still are, right? Because we're still, we need that as, um, as a big part of our election security is we need that paper. Uh, another area that I think maybe folks don't uh, think as much about, which is the voter registration books, whether they should be digital or paper. Uh, uh, what are your thoughts on this in, in terms of looking between the two? By voter registration books, do you mean just like the, the voter lists, like the, the poll books themselves? Yeah, that's right. Not You're not talking like online voter registration versus not online voter registration. Correct. Not talking about that, talking about like at the polling station itself. Yeah, so there's a number of advantages to electronic poll books. Um, we did put out like a brief paper on this and um, maybe Corey, you can add it into the chat as well. Um, so like for places that have vote centers, for example, where voters don't have to go to just one location to vote, they could go anywhere in the city. Um, some sort of electronic poll book is helpful because you would know that someone voted in a location regardless of where they went. Hopefully that makes sense to folks. So it also can enable people to update addresses in real time or do same day re voter registration. So there are some advantages. The challenge is that there's also um, risks, right? And there's vulnerabilities in place. Um, so if there's problems with connectivity, load issues, the device isn't working, you have to train poll workers on how to use it, it can really create some serious long lines. We saw it in Los Angeles in the primaries. Um, we're seeing it in Georgia right now with early voting. A lot of that's been linked to the check-in system actually. Um, so I think with any election technology, you have to make sure that you're um, planning for these vulnerabilities, thinking about what the plan B, plan C will be and making sure that those things are in place. So we always advocate having a paper poll book backup um, if you are going to use an electronic poll book. Um, so it's also important like that there's um, systems in place for those voter registration lists to constantly be having backups and security measures in place. Um, you know, that that's sort of related to the online voter registration. Like you have to make, make sure that there's security measures in place all the way through, right? Because like, it's all connected. And, and one point I, I hear you uh, repeating a lot is the interaction between using some of these uh, components like uh, hand marked ballots and uh, uh, poll books and the interaction between that and the long lines. Uh, whereas like, I think a lot of the times in the media we hear, we see these long lines and the rationale is like, oh, people are just excited to, to, to vote and, uh, and we're inevitably gonna have these long lines when people uh, are excited. Uh, rather than pointing to some of these other components that, that you're mentioning, which is like uh, 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 using handmarked ballots and uh, uh, physical poll books uh, to avoid some of these breakdowns or limitations of resources. Yeah, and I should say it's not like a. Uh, it always is a one-to-one -one cause and effect. There, there were long lines in Detroit in 2008, and that was not an electronic based voting system. Um, there have been long lines in places where there are handmarked paper ballots. So it's not like, it's not always so simple. Um, it's what causes long lines is complicated and should be studied. One of the things that I find um, disheartening and troubling is that like research consistently shows that black and brown voters are waiting in line longer than white voters. Um, and to understand the causes of like why there's that disparity, I think it's really critically important. And I think it's probably not just one reason, right? There's probably multiple things, right? So um, are there enough uh, devices, if it's a device issue, was there sufficient training? Are there enough polling locations, period? Are those polling locations accessible? Are, I mean, there's just like transportation, like there's just so many reasons why um, there could be long lines and it's not just one thing. Uh, uh, thank you for that. Those are some really good nuances to, to pick up on. Uh, so, uh, looking at uh, uh, electronic tabulators for, for ballots, what kinds of concerns should we have such as 
looking at software, whether they are able to connect to the internet, uh, thinking about things like chain of custody, what sort of, sort of components should we, think, should we be thinking about when we're looking at uh, ballot tabulators? Yeah, so any computer is vulnerable. What's important is that you have ways to mitigate both intentional and unintentional problems with tabulation. So election officials have um, chain, chain, custody, chain of custody and security measures in place for the proper storage of ballots beginning to end. Um, because if something happened with that computer that tabulated, you wanna make sure that you can then still look at the ballots later after the fact, right? So chain of custody is super important. Security measures in place from start to finish. And then you have to make sure that any computerized voting system has up-to-date software, has been tested. Um, we really, like these shouldn't be uh, connected to wireless modems, they sometimes are, um, but that's, um, it increases that risk factor, right? Um, and the best thing to do though, is to check that those ballots were counted accurately, which is why we're such strong like proponents for post-election audits and specifically risk limiting audits. Um. So uh, regarding uh, internet uh, connectivity, I mean, uh, if you can answer this, answer this, do you think it makes sense to have some of these uh, devices have a modem in the first place if they shouldn't be connected to the internet? So again, I'm not the technical expert on the team. There's a lot of people who could speak to this in way more detail than I can. So I like part of me hesitates to even go there just because it's not really my area of expertise. But again, like anytime you have that added technology layer, you have to make sure you're mitigating for any risks associated with it. Um, the reason, my understanding is the reason why some of those are connected to the internet is because of the way they report out results to like central offices or things like that. Um, so there's risks involved with that, right? And I, it's something that we're continuously looking at and that a lot of security, election security advocates, including those on our board, have advocated um, strongly against. Um, but I'm not, I'm not the computer scientist here, um, but I think it's like the most important thing is to be cognizant of those risks, to mitigate against them, and to, um, to, to really be aware that our election infrastructure, because it's so decentralized, it can be a little bit hard to regulate it, right? And so to be cognizant of the different risks in place in the different jurisdictions and different states, because every state's law is different and every voting system is different, like all of that has to be happening simultaneously. It's a, it's a big job and not, not one that any one person can do. Uh, uh, so uh, maybe you can imagine yourself being able to set up an idealized uh, scenario in terms of best election price, uh, practices. Uh, what would that scenario look like to you in terms of going from A to Z from the, the voter, uh, 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 getting their, their ballot, uh, casting it all the way through tabulation? What would an idealized process uh, look like to you? Yeah, so first off, an eligible voter should be able to register to vote. Um, they should be able to then vote, um, whether it is by mail or in person, um, with as, as few of her, as hurdle, uh, sorry, as few of hurdles as possible. Um, we also want to make sure that that vote was cast um, and counted as cast, right? So making sure that um, we trust the results. So from an election security standpoint, which is our expertise, paper ballots, like I've said many times, strong chain of custody, risk limiting audits, and no electronic return of voted ballots or voted materials at all. Um, you can't ever bring the risk down to zero. So in terms of your like idealized A to Z, I think it's really important to recognize that you can't bring the risk down to zero. Um, what you do have to do is set up processes so that you can monitor, detect, respond, and recover from any sort of attack or again, like an unintentional um, problem. And uh, that, that, that's, that's a nice uh, um, point that uh, we can always kind of reduce probability, but we can't eliminate it uh, altogether in many cases. Uh, we're thinking about um, the current setup that we have. What do you see some of the biggest deficits? Maybe thinking about some that are just uh, uh, moving us as far away from reducing risk and maybe also thinking about perhaps some low hanging fruit that uh, election administrators can deal with uh, pretty easily to reduce the, uh, to 
overall increase uh, uh, election integrity? Yeah, I mean, I think it's really important to understand and realize that there's just not enough resources and funding for election officials, especially in this um, really difficult election cycle where election officials are being tasked, most of them, with running two types of elections they've never run before, a large scale vote by mail and a large scale in person socially distanced like keeping in mind all of the different health recommendations from health experts uh, in person voting experience. So they're having to run two elections that they've likely never run before and to do so on shoestring budgets. Like they did pass some initial funding, but it really just hasn't been nearly enough in terms of what election officials need. Um, I think that there should also be more kind of federal guidelines for paper ballots and for audits. Um, I think there's benefit to the decentralized election process, but um, in having some of those guidelines, I think it can be helpful. Um, they're currently updating the, the voting system guidelines um, for folks. And um, there's just, there's a number of, sorry, I got a little distracted by that something was going on with the check. Um, there's a number of things that I think um, would help election officials in terms of creating um, more secure elections. Um, we're trying to fill the gap between technologists and the practical realities of running elections, right? Um, a lot of the election officials um, don't come from like a computer science or technology background. Um, and so um, we're, we try to kind of fill that gap between technology experts and election experts. So that's one of the things that we're trying to do. Um, and then I guess, you know, this is something that I think is so critical for folks to understand is that there's like the hacking of the actual infrastructure. There's also the hacking of the mind. And I think what we're seeing right now is that a lot of people's minds are being hacked in terms of like the trustworthiness of elections. Even like I think what happened in 2016 with um, the evidence of Russia infiltrating our election systems is that it caused this sort of internal panic right, um, in terms of our election infrastructure. And so I think that that's another piece that like it is really critical is um, doing something around how much disinformation there is right now in terms of social media and misinformation and people don't know what source to trust and who to listen to. And um, that's been a really big challenge as well for, for um, I think anyone who cares about elections in this country. So I guess, I guess like if the budget component wasn't as much of an issue uh, or was limited as an issue, uh, do you see any kind of like lower hanging fruit that uh, election officials can can do, like given a somewhat sufficient uh, budget or something that maybe is much more cost efficient as an intervention to reduce uh, some of these risks? Lower hanging fruit in terms of what exactly, sorry? Uh, so for instance, like. Uh, you've talked about some of these different types of, uh, of interventions, like having hand-marked ballots, uh, 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 risk-limiting auditing, uh, and also looking at polling books, and, and there are uh, others as well. So are, are there some of these that are perhaps easier to implement uh, overall, that are, that are kind of lower hanging fruit that we can implement, um, that are maybe not as intensive? Or I'm just trying to, uh, trying to think of, uh, given uh, uh, the situation that we have now with the, the the status quo, are there certain things that we can be doing that a little bit easier to uh, increase election integrity overall? It's hard for me to answer that like across the board because every election jurisdiction state has, they're in a really different place for election security and election integrity. So like what I would say in terms of like low hanging fruit for Colorado would be really different than for Louisiana or, you know what I mean? Like, it's just, it's really hard to say across the board, this is low hanging fruit. Um, I would say for this election cycle, um, it would be great to make sure that polling locations have paper poll book as a backup if they're using electronic poll books and that they also have emergency paper ballots if they're using ballot marking devices or direct recording electronic devices as well. So I would say like, those are two things for, those are two um, um, things for this election cycle that um, that could be implemented, but like that's that doesn't that's zero relevance 
to an entirely vote by mail state, like for example. Um, so it's, yeah, it's kind of hard for me to say across the board. And uh, speaking of the kind of the uniqueness of, uh, of like this election in particular and, and vote by mail, this is quite a bit unprecedented in the amount of people that are doing vote, vote by mail. Are there particular measures or things that we should be thinking about when we have such high uh, vote by mail incidents? Like for instance, uh, other states like Oregon, I think has been doing vote by mail for a while. Uh, Colorado uh, also moving moving forward in that direction. And, and, and now this year, like everybody really kind of taking a step, a forced a step forward there. Are, are there are there some additional measures that we should be thinking of related to voting integrity or uh, election integrity when we have higher vote by mail incidents? Yeah, so I'm gonna have Corey share in the chat. We put out some recommendations um, early on in the pandemic related to the increase of vote by mail and some of the security measures that we recommend when looking at an increase of vote by mail. Um, I think there's a number of things, I mean, it's sort of, I don't want to say it's too late, but it's, yeah, it is like, right, we're 14 days from the election. <laughs> like there's, there's only so much that you can do right now. Um, but I think ballot tracking is something that's really critical for increased vote by mail. It gives voters like some real, you know, I um, decided to vote um, through a mail-in ballot. I dropped it off at a Dropbox in Philly, but um, that's how I chose personally to vote this year. And it was really nice to get an email that said, hey, your ballot's been received, right? And to be able to track my ballot. Um, I think that thinking about different aspects like that is important when you're thinking about scaling vote by mail and doing so in a secure way. Um, you, chain of custody rules have to be really, um, you know, thought through from start to finish, right? Um, for drop boxes, for how it's going to work with the post office. But a lot of states have done this, like you said, like there's some states who have done this for a while. Um, it is hard to scale it up as quickly as a lot of states have had to do. Um, but there are also a lot of folks out there who are helping others do so. Um, National Vote at Home Institute um, and others who I think have been working with election officials side by side to help them figure out some of these processes. Um, what other, so before we talked about uh, risk limiting audits. Uh, so what happens when we do see a discrepancy? So uh, we see the ballot count and then uh, the risk limiting audit is done and it's showing something that has, they provides a, a significant discrepancy over what we would expect. Uh, so what are the, what do you see as the appropriate responses when we do see these anomalies or these discrepancies? Yeah, so if you think so, if, the, if there's something that indicates that something went wrong, um, that's, and you can start a recount of all those paper ballots to look at what the voters marked and what the, what the outcome really should be. And you can try to figure out what went wrong with the scanner, let's say. Um, so that's one way to correct it. You've also, uh, uh, in, in your intro, you mentioned uh, internet voting and a lot of like, your, the experts just not being a, a fan of that approach is, and that's also a question, by the way, we uh, we get asked that uh, quite a lot, even though that's not our, our area. Uh, now, uh, given that, would you, um, do you see internet voting, and again, this may be one where uh, you don't feel comfortable a answering and that's okay to punt it over, uh, do you, do you see particular security uh, concerns specific with internet voting that could possibly address, be addressed in the future or all the concerns with internet voting, um, just something that current or uh, even uh, future technology having a challenge with? Yeah, so um, the way I like to explain this just to kind of like non computer scientists right is that the the challenge is thinking about how to do so both securely and anonymously. So, um, you know, people will say, well, I can, I can bank online, like why can't I vote online. Well, when you're banking online, you can check your transaction, the bank can check your transaction, the store where you bought the shirt can also check the transaction. It's all tied to your identity. It's all tied to your uh, account, right? There's no anonymity at any point in those processes, zero anonymity, right? Um, 
voting is supposed to be anonymous. You should be able to vote and not have someone be able to find out who you voted for, right? And so I think the challenge is not just in the um, in keeping it secure, but in keeping it both secure and anonymous. And I think that that's the piece sometimes when you explain that to folks who say, well, I can vote on my phone or I can bank on my phone. Why can't I vote on my phone? When you explain, yeah, but then like, how would you do so secretly, truly secretly? Yeah, like for the entire country, like it's just, it's not like our technology is not there. Um, and that's why I think there's such, um, you know, like nearly unanimous agreement between computer scientists about the fact that we are not there in terms of technology. Uh, 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 what do you uh, normally do when uh, uh, someone responds uh, something, something, something uh, blockchain uh, related to uh, 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 internet voting? Yeah, so blockchain is designed to keep information secure once it's received. It can't defend against the multitude of threats that um, exist prior to receiving that. So voters can't verify their votes if they're entered into the blockchain correctly without compromising that ballot secrecy. Um, so there's, a, there's papers out there about blockchain. Um, it's all like a lot of researchers or a couple of researchers out of MIT um, did a study on votes, which is a blockchain voting application. Um, and so it's definitely worth checking out. Again, I'm not, I am not the computer scientist out of MIT, um, but those people are on our board um, and they have done research on it. And so we can share a little bit more about it um, in the chat. Well, um, oh, uh, with, uh, with our work, we are all about different uh, voting methods, particularly with uh, approval voting and different voting methods have their own uh, uh, challenges and advantages to each individual one. Uh, so you have voting methods that involve uh, ranking, scoring, approving as many as you want, and of course the classic choose one. And these voting methods have different properties, such as uh, some require central tabulation, where you have to have all the ballot data uh, together in one central location before you can even begin uh, tabulating them. Uh, others of them allow for precinct summability, where you can take totals from different precincts and then uh, sum those different uh, precinct totals together to get your, your grand total, so not requiring a central tabulation. So given some of these uh, voting methods with both the different type of data that they have, and the different properties that they have, such as central tabulation and precinct summability, how does, uh, do those factors, how do those factors make a difference with regard to election uh, integrity when we're thinking about um, uh, whether to, uh, uh, perhaps looking at, at different machines or hand-marked ballots, or even other concerns like risk limiting audits. Um, yeah, so every it, everything depends on how it's implemented. Um, so there's not really an efficient way to audit all, all of these different voting methods. Um, so it tends to be a bigger problem for alternative voting methods than a simple vote for one system in terms of that post-election audit. Like I. I think of the, the pictures of my audit team out in the field and they have these tally sheets and I don't know how those would work in a in, in these different kind of alternative voting method systems but you know again I'm not the statistician but I know that it creates a lot more challenges um, so it's just it's hard to hand count ballots when there's many different ways to vote in a contest. Um, so it's important to think about the nuts and bolts behind a voting method and whether voters are able to actually verify the final result. So it, it sounds like what you're saying is the simplicity of the voting method plays a role into some of these other components, potentially. Yeah, the simplicity and then also how it's actually implemented. I mean, um, yeah, there's a number of, of kind of practical elements, I think, that come into play when planning uh, risk limiting audits. Uh, no, I, I think we have uh, an anxious uh, uh, chat ready with uh, some extra questions. So um, I haven't been looking at it. So uh, Caitlin, uh, do you want to uh, start taking uh, questions for Chris? Sure. Yeah, I've got a few here <clears throat> that have um, folks have added. If anybody else has questions, if you haven't put anything in the chat, feel free to go ahead and add some questions there now. We'll try to get to them. Um, so at the very beginning, Kathleen Bradley um, 
asked, she says, we use mini iPads for electronic poll books and nothing but microfiber cloth is supplied to poll workers to clean the screen. What do other jurisdictions use? I, and she said, I should have added that dirty screens may result in a problem in reading signatures. Um, so I don't know if this is a, something that you can address, Chris. Um, definitely not our, it's not like verified voting sites for T's in terms of how people are cleaning the different devices. I have heard of people, um, this is sort of a different question, but um, I have heard of people using Q-tips as kind of um, an alternative to having to use a touch screen during the pandemic. I've also seen like little finger covers that have been um, given out to um, voters in different jurisdictions where it's required. Um, but for for screen cleaning, I feel like I'm I feel like I'm not able to help, unfortunately. <laughs> Sorry. That's okay. Hopefully, hopefully, Kathleen, you guys can find some other better alternatives. Um, all right. And then we've got a question from Paul Burke. This is another question about risk limiting audits. If it's a bit too technical, we can direct him. Maybe you all can direct him to um, uh, the website or another resource. But he says, "Is risk limiting audits are are risk limiting audits useful?" where the public can't see marks on sampled ballots for bringing from storage. Paul, I'm not sure exactly what you meant about the bringing from storage, but does, does that question make sense to you, Chris? Um, yeah, so I think that there's um, a component of risk limiting audits that we advocate for around transparency to the public. Um, and making sure that um, like if, if the goal, like the goal of it is in part to increase public confidence and transparency in the process, I think helps increase that public confidence. One of the challenges that I think election officials are facing right now in COVID times is how to, how to make certain processes, including tabulation or um, <clears throat> for those audits um, viewable to the public during the pandemic in a safe way. Um, we've seen some people get really creative with it in terms of like um, live streaming um, certain events and things like that. Um, but again, those, like a lot of those take resources and planning and a lot of election officials are underwater. But we do have um, a paper on the observability of audits, um, which Corey can drop into the chat, which might be of interest to um, the viewer who asked that question. And I'm sorry, your name is escaping me. But yeah, we'll share that because we, we did put out that paper um, a while ago. Awesome. All right, and then we've got a question from SAS. Um, he says, while states like Washington and Oregon have had phenomenal success with vote by mail, New York has not in their 2020 primaries. What are the most important things to get right about vote by mail and do vote by mail exclusive elections disenfranchise any voter demographics that we aren't told about? Yeah, so um, it's there has definitely been some problems I think that we've seen in terms of trying to rapidly scale up vote by mail. Um, so valid votes should count and invalid votes shouldn't. Um, most jurisdictions have processes already in place to minimize verification problems um, and that sort of control measure, but it isn't perfect. Um, I think we have to figure out what the scope of the problem was. In some ways, I think it was good that we had so many I don't, I mean, no one thinks anything was good about the pandemic, right? But having all these primaries happen um, has allowed a lot of jurisdictions to learn a lot of lessons before the general election. Um, and so you have to assess the scope, like what number of signatures are rejected, um, which ones aren't, is there a discrepancy? Um, and there really needs to be, there does need to be a process in place to verify voters. Um, but there's also a way to cure um, a signature mismatch in a lot of these places, like in Oregon and Colorado. Um, and so making sure that you have the opportunity to correct that. So like if a signature is mismatched, for example, that a voter can correct that so that they're still able to vote is something that we um, advocated for in those in those recommendations that we mentioned um, around vote by mail during the pandemic and how to make sure that you still have security measures in place. Awesome, that's really helpful. Um, and I don't, I don't know if you have any insight into this, uh, Chris, but SAS was also wondering about, you know, if there are any voter demographics that maybe are disenfranchised that we buy vote by mail that we don't we're 
it, it's not as obvious to us. Um, and I know that's not exactly in in the mission of verified voting, but I don't know if you have any information on that. Yeah, there's a good amount of research on this. Um, it's interesting because I think, um, you know, you can look at Colorado's stats on voting and they have been able to increase turnout quite a bit. Um, but in terms of like the signature mismatch, um, there it has been shown to disproportionately impact certain voters, um, sometimes younger voters, sometimes people of color, and also older voters where maybe they're having problems with dexterity or arthritis or something like that. Um, so um, voters with disabilities, there's sometimes there's different um, measures in place to give people an option if they can't sign their name for some reason. Every state is different and I don't pretend to be a law in, in these different aspects, or I don't pretend to be an expert in these different aspects of the law. Um, so, so that's important to realize. The other, the other category of voters that I think, where I think vote by mail is challenging is people who move a lot. Um, and people who are from low income backgrounds tend to move more than those from higher income backgrounds. Um, so making sure that there's always an option for people to vote in person, I think is really critical. Um, and to make sure that that option is available on election day and ideally beforehand as well. Um, so you can't, you can't exclude in person voting, I think, from from the options available to voters ever. Good to know. All right. The other, sorry, the other category of people that just came to mind is um, Native Americans, um, because they may not have, like, sometimes they have a PO box and you can't use that or whatever. So there's, there's a number of reasons why those communities are often disenfranchised by vote by mail as well. So like I said, you have to make sure that you still have the option to vote in person. Absolutely. That's really important to remember. Um, all right, this one is less of a question, but I th more of a comment, but I thought it was interesting. Sandy mentioned that she's found that as a poll worker, one of one of the reasons for slowdown of voting processes is people not knowing what district they vote in. So then they have to take the time to look it up. Um, and then also people assuming that they're still on the books, but actually they've been purged. So she says she thinks all citizens um, should who are eligible should be eligible to vote and electronic poll books that have everyone listed would take care of those slowdown issues. So it seems like maybe um, the, the important thing would be to have those electronic poll books, right, that are all up to date, but having, um, having the paper backup, like you said, Chris. Yeah, and the paper backup is probably only going to be for that polling location because, you know, you could imagine a paper backup for all of Los Angeles. So it's yeah. That would be ginormous. Right? Um, it wouldn't really work. Um, but it is actually, the, this question speaks to one of the reasons why we have a campaign called Check Your Reg. Um, so we really um, support people checking their voter registration consistently. Um, it's a good way to spot if there's if there have been any problems in the voter rolls. Um, and it also can give you more familiarity in terms of your precinct number and like things like that that sometimes I think people don't like no instinct, I mean, some people do, right? But not everyone does. But if you're checking it more consistently, I think that you're more likely to know about those things. And we can share, I think um, we have a page for our Check Your Edge campaign in case you wanna download any of the digital assets and share it on your social media. Perfect. All right, it looks like right now, I just have two more questions. Um, I'll, I'm gonna do a last call. If anybody else has additional questions they'd like to add, please go ahead and stick them in the chat now. Um, all right, so Chip Spangler asks, what would you think of a system that utilized non-networked DRE systems that also printed out paper ballots that were then scanned in in an optical scanner? Such a system would have three vote counts available, the DRE machines, the scanner totals, and the paper ballots. I think that I'd think that such a system would provide more options for verification. Polling locations could have paper only ballots available as backups and also for mail in voting. I know that's a lot. So let me know if you need me to repeat any of it. I think I'm not quite understanding the difference between that and, a, and ballot marking devices. Um, I, I think we can share our paper on why we don't advocate for ballot marking devices for all voters. Um, so yeah, I think that that's, I, I'm a little bit confused by that question. Um, I am not the 
voting technology expert. We have a lot of those people on our board. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and rely on some of the policy pieces that we've put out um, prior to this um, call for folks to check out that would answer some of those questions. Awesome. All right, then we've got one from Craig Dimitri. He is in suburban Philadelphia. He says, I have been categorically recommending to everyone who asks me, vote by mail or Dropbox. It's safe, secure, COVID safe for voters and poll workers and to make a plan to vote, vote as early as you can. I've been told that every mail-in ballot will put less stress on the in-person voting system because it means one less person on election day under pandemic conditions. Is this the best practice for me to recommend? Um, so I, it's really hard for me to say recommending a best practice for voting method because it's just so person specific. Um, just like as an example, right? Like my husband's a physician, his schedule is really wonky like voting by mail is great for him. He, um, there's not a Dropbox location, like now there is, but when he was wanting to vote, like there wasn't a location that was close to us. Um, anyways, it's just, it's a really, there's like really personal decisions with voting and how people vote. Some people really like to go in person. They want to get that voting sticker on election day. Um, I'm not a public health expert in terms of like COVID spread. Um, I think like it's really critical for voters to have options right now and to have options for voting. Um, and so I think we've seen some states increase those options because of COVID, um, which I think is a good thing. But um, yeah, it's just like, there's just so many factors, transportation, accessibility, language issues. Um, I, I mean, I was talking to a voter the other day who spoke no English like mail and she had applied for a vote by mail ballot because she was she's very nervous about covid but she's having a really hard time understanding the method she's never voted that way before and speaks no english so it's just like there's just such personal decisions when it comes to voting and it's really hard for me to say like yep that's what you should recommend for everyone because like that i don't know i don't know everyone's story yeah, I think, I think the bottom line that you got to there, Chris, is options, right? We need as many options as possible um, to make it as easy as possible, reduce as, as many of the barriers and make sure that everyone, no matter their personal story, their background, their accessibility, whatever, has access, right? Um, all right, we've got two more questions then, and then we'll wrap up. So from SAS again, I think this is a really interesting question. SAS asks, people posting pictures of their filled out ballots online is an issue that is not going away. Do you think this means that protected voter anonymity has become irreparably broken? What should be our collective reaction to this issue? Um, to people like posting their selfie with their voted ballot. I think that's the question more or less that I'm getting. Yeah. Um, uh, every, you know, there's different laws in different states around this. Um, so it, the question was how to prevent it, Caitlin, or what was that? Um, yeah, what, what should be our collective reaction to this issue? Do we think that people, I don't know, maybe people aren't as concerned about anonymity as, as they should be or as that were, you know, as they previously were, or what are their actions that we can take to help prevent this? Is there any, you know, particular reaction we should have to people posting these pictures? Maybe thinking, is it is it a big issue if someone explicitly kind of opts out to the anonymity? Yeah. Um, I, you know, like that's really not an issue that verified voting has, um, that I know of. And I, I, like I joined in February that we've, um, really been focused on because we're focused on the verifiability of elections. Um, I think just because like one person overshares on the internet doesn't mean that we should like make it a thing for everyone to be able to do so. Right. Yeah. Like these are, these are principles that are enshrined in our constitution for a reason. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I don't know if that answers the question at all, but I'm just like, I, I don't know if I can control what like people post on TikTok or on like Instagram. Um, 
I think there might be like some public norms around like why anonymity as far as voting matters. Um, that like, you know, maybe needs to be revisited, but I don't, I don't know if that answers the question at all. <laughs> That's my initial thought. I don't know, Aaron, if you have any thoughts on that. I, uh, I won't comment. I'll leave it. Uh, I'll leave it to you or to uh, so you can uh, or you can punt it to the uh, to the other folks. Okay. <laughs> All right, then we've just got one final question and then we will hop off of here. So um, this is another question about uh, RLAs. Um, if we need to refer to a resource, that's fine. So Paul at, Paul says, Dr. Dr. Stark says ballot comparison RLA requires an independent, unhacked tally of 100% of votes. Does anyone know how to create a publicly verifiable tally? I am gonna, I do, I do not have the, the knowledge to answer that question well, so I'm not gonna try. <laughs> um, again, yeah, it's just really not, my expertise. Um, we'll share one of our resources in the chat. I'm not sure if it'll answer that question. Uh, uh, do you mind if I ask uh, one uh, final question, uh, Kayla and Chris? Go right ahead. Yeah. Uh, so should it matter which polling location uh, someone goes to? That That is, should a system really require individuals to go to a particular location rather than um, it being I guess agnostic for the voter to allow them to be able to cast a, a vote regardless of the um, polling site that they're at. Um, yeah, that's really not verified voting's issue in a lot of ways, right? So like, if you think about it, like we've been really focused on what happens after someone casts their ballot, not where they're casting it. So I don't, you know, I don't know if I, I have an answer to that question. Totally fine. Totally fine. Yeah. Yeah. Like you're asking basically about like vote centers, right? Versus like being required to go to the one, you know, like church across the street, you know, that's like three blocks down. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think as far as like accessibility is concerned, like people should have options that are close to where they live so that they don't have to rely on transportation and any, any number of things. Um, but our concern really hasn't, like our focus is really around technology use in elections and really on the verifiability of our election results and what happens after someone casts their vote. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, and, and don't feel bad. We get lots of questions about election issues that are completely unrelated to our particular mission all the time. Um, it's, you know, it just happens. So. That's totally okay. Um, well, thank you so much, Chris, for taking the time to be here with us tonight. This is a super important topic. It seems like people were really engaged. There was lots of comments, lots of resources being shared in the chat. So um, to anyone who did join, I would definitely recommend that you download that chat log because there's lots of good links in there coming from Corey at Verified Voting. And there's lots of other good links and information from fellow audience members. Um, but thank you all for attending. Uh, like I mentioned, we are the Center for Election Science and we have lots of, we have a campaign going on right now in St. Louis. We have um, lots of uh, chapters and other um, campaigns in the works for the coming year or two. So um, we're, we're getting really excited about bringing approval voting to more cities and, and empowering voters with that. Um, if you would like to donate, Erin has um, put our donate link in the chat and definitely go check out Verified Voting's uh, website. Like I said, there's lots of links to Verified Voting in the chat. They have so much good information, so many good resources about election integrity and security. Um, and everyone, please stay safe and go vote in whatever option works best for you.